It is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Eric Carter. I must say, even though I've known Eric very many years, it's a bit intimidating to introduce someone like Eric. Um, he's an amazing scholar. I mean, he is an amazing scholar. Um, he's made incredible contributions across his career to the field of special education and transition to work. So I have a few of the more formal uh, things that I'd like to say about Eric, just to kind of put in, in context. Um, first off, he is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Special Education at Vanderbilt. That's a named professorship because of his high esteem in which he is held. He also serves as co-director for the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Enormous role overseeing multiple projects. His research and teaching focuses on strategies for promoting full participation, belonging, and valued roles in school, work, community, and congregational settings for children and adults with intellectual disability. In other words, translation, he's really concerned about people with disabilities and creating wonderful outcomes for people in the community, not just doing research for research's sake, but really making a difference. Dr. Carter has published widely in the areas of educational and transition services for children and youth with disabilities, including more than 250 articles and book chapters and seven books that he's written. He's received numerous prestigious national awards for his research and brought in over 28 million in external grant funding. Can you imagine? Like, that's a lot of money for these projects that he's leading. Um, he's also served as co-editor of the Journal of Career Development and Transition for Exceptional Individuals and also as an editor on five other journals. Among the many projects he directs um, that are probably most relevant to our uh, symposium that we have here today, one is called um, Transition Tennessee and the other one is Tennessee Works, both with an emphasis on either um, school to adulthood transition or school to work transition, both of these focusing on improving uh, transition services in Tennessee for individuals with disabilities. So um, as I was thinking about how to wrap up about Eric today, I think the thing that I want you to know is first is I can't fully even begin to capture all of his contributions to the field, but they're magnificent. Um, but what I really want you to know about Eric is that despite all of his many contributions to the field and how he has advanced the field and the work that we do um, in our country, what I want you to know is he's really a very down-to-earth guy, a very humble guy who cares very deeply about conducting research that makes a difference and that is geared toward improving outcomes for people with intellectual and, and developmental disabilities. Um, so, Eric, we're thrilled to have you here today. Please join me in, in welcoming uh, Eric Carter. That was really generous. <laughs> and as my wife would probably say, that was a lot of gravy for a turkey or something. <laughs> I forget how that goes. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for all of you uh, for being here and being part of this. It is an honor to be among so many educators and leaders and providers and professionals who I know care so deeply about the flourishing of youth and young adults with disabilities, to help them thrive in all areas of their lives, uh, academically, relationally, vocationally, and all the ways that we know matters most. And I share that commitment that you have of creating a real future of thriving and even flourishing all across the state. I'm invested in that work in Tennessee, and I know you're deeply invested in that here in Illinois. So I'm also just so grateful for the really compelling work of the Illinois Center for Transition and uh, Work in this area. So Stacy said, I am a professor at Vanderbilt University and a teacher trainer, but I began my career as a high school transition teacher, trying to help young people graduate into a good life after high school and all the ways that mattered to them to help them realize all the goals that were in front of them as well. And so we're really trying to help students assume valued roles in their communities and to participate meaningfully in all aspects of community life that were important to them and ultimately to find the kind of rich and lasting relationships that we know really contribute to flourishing in their lives. 
But the work that I also do, like many of you, also focuses on how we invite and engage new partners in this work, not just schools and agencies like yours, uh, who will have missions addressing disability, but also employers and community organizations and ordinary residents in our towns who think they don't know a thing about disability, but know their community well and care about its flourishing and could be drawn upon in clever ways to come alongside us in this important work of promoting successful transitions. My sense is that we're not going to change outcomes unless we get new partners and new allies in our communities to come alongside us in this work. And so I think we share a couple things in common then in this sense. One is we're all committed to helping young people with significant disabilities thrive in their communities and in their workplaces. And second, we're all invested in building capacity in our local communities to welcome and weave people with disabilities into the full life of their community, into the workplace, into the neighborhoods, into community activities, in ways that communities come to say we are incomplete without people with disabilities. That's the goal that we're all aiming towards. And so I've titled this talk, uh, The Road to Employment, the postures, practices, and partnerships that matter most. And I hope it will help tie together a lot of the themes that have already come up in the symposium yesterday and later this afternoon. So now, because it was emphasized that I'm a researcher, I feel obligated to begin my talk with data. And everyone knows good talks always begin with data, don't they? Yeah, okay, I hope you've had your coffee <laughs> and it's kicked in because I actually want to share a study with you that comes from Illinois. It's actually a uh, groundbreaking study. I'm mean, a little arrogant here. It is actually earth shattering in terms of what we've done. We have analyzed IEPs and transition plans from tens of thousands of students with disabilities all across Illinois. And we have proven something that no one else has ever yet sought to prove. And I'm going to share that with you this morning. As this perfectly prepared graph shows, we have documented that children with disabilities in Illinois on average get one year older with each passing year. <laughs> it's just like a mic drop. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> It's actually a perfect linear relationship for those of you who are interested in statistics, but I should advertise that this is actually not peer reviewed. So it may, I don't know if it'll pass muster, right? Right? What is my poorly made point here? It's that adulthood with all of its opportunities and challenges, it's coming for our students where it's already here. They grow up, it's what they tend to do. And transition begins actually very early and it continues on well past high school as well. And preparation for the world of work doesn't just begin at some discrete point when we start doing transition planning. It already began long before students arrive into middle school and high school and it continues afterwards. And so it starts, we start to realize then it becomes our collective efforts. Those of us in this room, those of us who precede us in the earlier grades and come after us in adult services, that we've got to sort of work in tandem across this age span to put students in the very best position to attain their goals in the area of employment and other areas. What we know is that it's our collective expectations that we hold and the services we deliver and the supports that we arrange and the relationships that we forge that make the difference between those students who graduate to a flourishing future and those students with disabilities who don't. It's our collective investment over a long haul period of time, not some discrete event at the cusp of graduation or at the moment of doing a transition plan. So for those of you who are working in school systems, which I know as many of you, we have to actually be able to draw a line between the experiences we're providing our students in school directly to the employment and other outcomes that we hope they'll obtain after high school. And if we can't draw a clear line between those experiences we're providing and the instruction we're delivering and, uh, and the opportunities in our community to those post-school employment goals, we can't be confident that one is going to lead to the other. How do we promote a future of flourishing for our students? And of course, this begs the question, what does it even mean to flourish for students with disabilities? I think this is a question that's actually at the core of our work around promoting transition to employment and so many other areas. What does it look like for our students to flourish, to know that we've done a really fine job of this transition to adulthood? Uh, what does it mean for them to thrive in their communities after graduation? And what would be the things that you would point to as you think about the students who've come through your school systems or that you're receiving on the other end of adult service systems that tell you that the students we serve and support are really flourishing? We could probably talk a long time about what that means and what that looks like uh, for our students in our particular schools and communities. 
But if you're not sure how to answer that question right now, you're struggling a little bit, like, I don't really know what flourishing would look like, let me just encourage you to reverse the question, right? Ask yourself, what does it uh, look like for anyone to flourish? What does it look like, did it look like for me to flourish in my transition to life after high school? And so we reverse the question when we're stuck on tough things like that. What are the things that contribute to our own thriving right now in our lives? What are the markers of flourishing in our lives? Is it the jobs that we have? Is it the relationships that we experience? The places we get to go in our community, the groups that we're part of, the activities that we get to do, the contributions that we get to make in the lives of others, or maybe you'd name something else altogether. Or maybe you're not sure at all. Maybe being two years into a pandemic, the flourishing is the last thing from our minds. But there was a time when you thought a lot about what a good life would be like for you. And it was actually back when you were in high school. Um, so I'm gonna do something a little traumatic for most of the people in this room. I need you to actually go back in time to when you were a teenager in high school. I know I'm seeing some hot sweats coming, some, uh, <laughs> some memories flooding back. But how would you have answered that question, what did you look forward to most about life after high school? Some of you are having a tough time going back in time, so I have brought some visual prompts to kind of take you <laughs> right there, and now you've arrived. <laughs> but think about it back then. Yeah, it's the guy with the cat, I know, so. But what was it that you were looking forward to most about life after graduation? What excited you about the future? You had some hopes of living a good life. You wouldn't have talked about it that way, but you envisioned some kind of future for yourselves. I imagine you did. And if we went around the room now and actually had you share those things out, I imagine that we'd hear lots of different answers to those questions about the experiences and the relationships that would matter most to you. But there's probably gonna be some themes if we did that. You'd be talking about finding a meaningful job, and hopefully many of you have found that in the jobs that you're in now. Many of you would have talked about going to college as a pathway to that great job, or moving out and getting a good place to live, which of course requires a good job, and maybe being part of your community in some other way, right? These are certainly things that lead to our flourishing. And I pause here because these are the things that we tend to measure as schools and organizations, right? These are the things that we tend to track and we call them outcomes, right? And uh, they're good things to know about. We want to know whether our students are attaining these kinds of things. They're found in our post-school indicators, indicator 14 is a way we measure this in our VR databases as well. So these are one important set of things that we want to keep our eyes on. But I want to push this further because I think that most of us would agree that real flourishing extends beyond that narrow set of outcomes, beyond whether and where you work or whether and where you go to college or where you happen to live in the community. When we talk about the things that really bring us life, we tend to talk about those things like having enduring friendships and intimate relationships on having opportunities to make a difference in the lives of other people, uh, on feeling and being needed, on being able to steer your life in the ways and directions that you choose, on being part of a community of belonging, on feeling well, on being safe, and many, many others that we might name. These are also markers of flourishing in adulthood for those with and without disabilities, and they're not actually disconnected from our pursuits of meaningful work for our students. In fact, they're actually tightly bound. So it's good for us to know, it's very good for us to know whether our students are experiencing good outcomes, but it's also important to know whether they're experiencing good lives. Or if you know the work of Anne and Rudd Turnbull, they talk about enviable lives, the kinds of lives that any other young person might want to experience for themselves. And these are both really important to me because they're yoked together. If we get, connect students to a good job or presence in their neighborhood or lifelong learning opportunities, then the opportunities they have to develop friendships and to live out their vocation and to contribute in valued roles and to find a place of belonging, all those become more likely because we've connected them to good outcomes as well. But what you also start to see, if we're looking at all the things on our screen as things that we think are important in anyone's lives, we have to start thinking about how do we work beyond, not just with schools and agencies, but other people in our community that can help us bring these things to pass for our students. 
It's a tall order for us as schools, for example, to think about transitioning young people to all of these good outcomes to work and beyond without the partnerships and uh, connections in our local community that are so critical to making that happen. So let me return back to that question that I posed earlier, what would it look like for the students that you support to flourish? It should be a really easy thing to answer now because it's the same set of answers that you would have answered for yourself. Right? Young people with disabilities want the very same things as anyone else. And that's also true when we think about the world of work. Work matters to young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities for the same set of reasons it matters to anyone else. And we're in the midst right now of a multi-year research project that's focused on youth and young adults with complex support needs. And we asked parents whose sons and daughters are transition age or youth and young adults who've accrued paid work experience in their community about why work matters so much in the lives of their sons and daughters. And the responses are up on your screen. They're ordered from most to least emphasized, right? They talk about things like um, work instilling a sense of pride, uh, furthering their independence, providing purpose, right? contributing to financial independence, creating social connections, um, introducing valued role, sparking joy, and on and on and on. So we don't pursue just work just because it's a good outcome, because it's the gateway to so many other good things for our students as well. So you've probably then picked up on the next point that I wanted to make, and that's that the presence of a disability isn't at all a reliable aspirations uh, of people's lives, right? A disability is not a predictor of what people want for their lives. We're so prone in professional circles to kind of use disability as a way of highlighting what's different about someone or distinct about a particular group of people, and we forget to place the accent on what uh, we all have in common. And you spend a lot of time talking with youth and young adults, I'm sure, with significant disabilities. Uh, the students that we spend time with in our high schools and even in our post-secondary programs tell us that they want a satisfying job. And they want close relationships. And they want a comfortable and safe place to live and a college degree. That's amazing more and more that young people with intellectual disability are actually pursuing college now. They want to be involved in their community and have a chance to give something back. They want friends they can count on, someone they can love. They want to have a say in their own lives, but also to have an influence on the lives of others. They want to be part of a caring community, and they want a killer future to look forward to. Right? These are not unusual special needs. These are ordinary needs that our students want just like anyone else. The presence of a disability is not a reliable predictor of what people want for their lives. A few years ago, we brought together some young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Tennessee, all of whom were transitioning through high school, and some were part of uh, one of the six college programs for students with intellectual disability in Tennessee, and we just asked them about the world of work and what the future might hold. And I just want you to listen to them as they respond to a simple question that we were all asked back when we were in high school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you'll just hear their answers sound utterly ordinary. It is Nashville. I would like to be a sport guy when I grow up at a museum. I want to work at FedEx. I want to work at Publix and Fieldstone Farms. I'd like to be a mousekeeper. Or a flute. I want to be a special education teacher. We love working with, with teens in that way. But that's, I think that's what we're charged with doing, is helping young people connect 
to the job of their dreams. A young woman who's a songwriter, wanted to be a songwriter, actually is a songwriter. She works down on Music Row, not as a musician, but uh, works in one of the studios and has been able to cut a couple demos related to that. So like most people in Tennessee <laughs> who are trying to break into that. That probably sounds anecdotal to you, but that's why they invited a researcher to the podium, because the plural of anecdote is data, <laughs> right? And the data tell us the same thing. When you look at national studies that look at the goals of young people with disabilities, you start to see the same kind of patterns. Uh, according to the National Longitudinal Study 2012, when they ask young people with disabilities about what they want in the early years after graduation, 95% of youth with autism expect to have a, a paid job in those early young adulthood years. The same is true for 94% of youth, young people with intellectual disability. They don't have dreams of underemployment or unemployment. They don't aspire to piece rate wages or sheltered workshops. They don't say they envision for themselves a lifetime of exclusion from the workforce. They have gifts to bring to the world and they want to bring it. And that's what we hear from young people all the time. The same is true for college. Three quarters of youth with autism expect to go on to some kind of post-secondary education. Half of all young uh, high school students with intellectual disabilities are now also thinking about college in some way. They don't wanna miss out on lifelong learning opportunities and tailgate parties and new experiences and actually a real career pathway. And the same is true in the area of residential as well, which I know is not the focus of, of today's conversation, but they don't dream of living in long, large congregate settings unless you're talking about a college dorm, and they envision more than life on the couch. They wanna have a life, they wanna live it well. My point in all of this is that we have to know the aspirations of the students that we're serving well enough to know what matters most to them, to ask good questions, to listen really carefully to the answers that come verbally or come in other ways for those who have complex communication needs. And then align what we do and very, be very strategic about our partnerships that, so that our students have the very best chance of attaining those dreams. So do we know what those aspirations are of the young people that we're serving and supporting and teaching? And our working assumption should begin with that there isn't a separate set of dreams for these students. But then this is where our collective work comes in. It's one thing to know what people aspire to, it's quite another to sort of help that actually materialize. And we know that there's a big gap between the aspirations that young people have in the area of work and elsewhere and the actual outcomes they ultimately experience. Between their vision of flourishing in a workplace and the actual experiences that they end up having. And if you agree with that, uh, then I think then one important barometer of the success of what we do in transition at our local district level all the way up to the state and national level becomes the degree to which young people with disabilities actually attain the outcomes that they set as goals when they're in high school. It's not judged by really what we write down on a transition plan or the boxes we check off on some report. It's not gauged in the services and supports that we plan to deliver, all of which are very, very important, but it's ultimately the degree to which people obtain the goals that they have for their life after high school, whether they obtain jobs, develop good relationships, experience good lives. And that's why it's so critical that compliance mindsets give way to these outcome mindsets. And I'm not suggesting that here people have a mindset of just doing what's just enough, of meeting the letter of the law, of dotting our I's and crossing our T's, but so often we see compliance uh, uh, not as, a, it really should just be the floor, <laughs> the baseline, not the ceiling for where we stop. And we've all seen beautifully crafted IEPs and transition plans that are never actually implemented in practice. Not in this room, I'm sure, of course. Written plans that pass muster in many ways, but actually don't lead to the workplace. We've seen compliant individualized support plans, employment plans that never really lead to a better life. And mere compliance rarely leads to paid jobs. And I emphasize this because one of the other sets of enduring data that we see is this gap between expectations or aspirations and outcomes. And I'm gonna combine data sources here from different kinds of studies, but you'll get the point really quickly. When you look on the left of each of these uh, screens, you'll see what people aspire to after graduation. And on the right is the actual experiences that we see across the country. 
there's a wide gap between aspirations and experiences. 95% of young people with disabilities expect to have paid jobs. 21% of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities have paid jobs. That's a big difference between those two numbers as well. And it's a difference that actually sort of is dramatically different as you look across the country from one state to the next. Don't try to find your own state, that's not the point of this graphic. But I've put up the uh, employment rates by, from state to state, all the way ranging from 3% integrated employment rates in Hawaii to 85% in Washington. Um, that's a pretty wide range span when people with intellectual disability are the same across states. It starts to push us to realize this isn't inherently an outcome that's associated with disability. It has as much to do with the expectations and practices and programs that we deliver that make the difference between students who do and do not obtain those outcomes. Similar kinds of disconnects around uh, college access in terms of who actually goes on but who aspires to it. And the same thing in terms of independent living. My point in all of that isn't to bring us down with the data. By the way, I see a lot of cameras coming up. Uh, I, uh, all of the um, slides will be available for sale for $19.99. <laughs> They'll all be posted uh, on the website, so you'll have all of those so you don't have to feel a scramble. For free, of course. <laughs> But my point is that for us who are professionals, whether we're working in schools or agencies or elsewhere, we have to really see equipping young people to achieve these employment outcomes as the primary purpose, our central charge. It's actually, if you pull out IDEA on the very first couple pages of the law that governs special education services, it describes this work as the purpose of special education. It's why we send kids to school for 18 to 21 years. It says the purpose of special education among them is to prepare students for further education, employment, and independent living. So we start to see that's one of the markers of whether we're doing that work well. And for those of you working in adult service systems, national policy is aimed at the very same thing. But we talk about it as a quality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. Those are just jargon-filled ways, in my view, of saying our charge is to help our students flourish in the world of work and beyond. And it's not about groups of individuals for us, it's actually about individuals. As we think about the students that are in our classroom or on our caseload or that we work with, uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between what Emma desires and experiences or what Liam desires and experiences and on and on and on. So what can you conclude from this flurry of data for those of you who walked in a little bit late or your coffee's just kicking in, two really simple points. First is that youth with intellectual and developmental disability overwhelmingly tell us that they want to be at the center of their communities, not on the peripheries or on the margins. And the second thing is that that desire for inclusion in the workforce and beyond isn't always well supported in our communities or even in our schools. The gap between the involvement people want and that what they have is still too wide and that's why we're all invested in this work is trying to reduce that particular gap. And that's why the transition years are such a critical juncture for equipping our students with the skills and the knowledge and the supports and the linkages that make success in the workplace possible. People often talk about transition as the last best chance for changing employment trajectories. I'm, I think there's practically some truth to that, although we know there's a lot more we can offer to young people and their families even after the school bus stops coming. But what can we do better or more of or differently? Well, it's not recipe work for sure. This is work that takes ongoing commitment and creativity and a lot of course corrections. There's a bit of art and science to this work. I want to emphasize a little of both of those in my remaining time with you. What I can share with you is what we've learned as a field about the ways we can work to put our students in the very best position to flourish in the workplace and in the communities that they call home. And I want to do this by addressing kind of what I call the three Ps. The postures that we adopt, the practices that we pursue, and the people that we engage. Now, the postures, the practices, and the people. So what do I mean by postures? I'm referring here to actually our approach and our attitudes as we go about serving youth and young adults with significant disabilities. 
It's that combination of beliefs that we hold and the values that we affirm and the way we see students with disabilities. And I'm using the word postures here very deliberately because it really emphasizes what people see and experience when they're in our midst as educators and professionals. It's this visible evidence of what we hold inside. In other words, our values aren't something that are just held, they're actually experienced by our students. Our beliefs about them aren't just held internally, they're experienced by our students. And our postures and core principles that we bring to this work end up shaping all of our practices. And so there are some postures that I think we've learned are particularly powerful in this work. And I bet these are ones that you've already adopted in your lives and in your work, and I bet you could add more to this list. I won't talk about all at length, I just want to highlight a handful so you kind of sort of get this point of the importance of what we think and the principles we hold. And I'll start with expectations because the expectations that we hold as educators and providers and other professionals have to at least match the aspirations of our students. And I would argue they actually have to be above the aspirations of our students, even when students can't envision employment, that we can almost envision that on their behalf. Because one of the most powerful forces in changing outcomes for students with disabilities, uh, not just during the transition years, but particularly during transition years, turns out to be the expectations that professionals and uh, parents and others hold. You can look at our history, even a cursory glance, and you see this really quickly. When people held expectations that were dramatically different from the rest of the people in our communities or in our society, that's when outcomes started to change for students with significant disabilities. Think back to the history of our field. I was, uh, my kids often tell me that I'm old. And I, I vigorously debate that. I mean, I very forcefully debate that. And then they remind me that I was born back in the 1900s, and I have to relent. Because <laughs> that sounds like a really long time ago, right? Well, a lot of you are old, too. You were born back in the 1900s. And uh, I'm just thinking about my lifespan of, of just about 50 years. Uh, there was a time when I was uh, early on and born when people wondered whether certain kids could even learn. That was the thing people wondered. But there were parents and there were teachers and professionals who were certain that they could, and they opened up schools, and now we're opening up colleges. It's amazing. There's a time not long ago when people wondered whether certain young people with disabilities could be trusted to be a leading influence in their own lives. But then there was these self-advocacy groups and disability organizations and professionals and others who were certain that they should and that they could and they proved that was possible, and we're seeing more and more voices of students with disabilities leading this work. And there was a time not long ago, and maybe still presently, when people wondered whether certain young adults with significant disabilities would have anything meaningful to contribute in the workplace. But then there were transition teachers and job coaches and agencies and employers who were certain that they would, and they proved that was possible too. My point in all this is we've been so fortunate in our history to have professionals and families much like yourself who challenged prevailing views in their communities about what's possible. And that's just as important moving forward. We're having the conversations now about inclusive work because of these past expectations. But those expectations really matter now as well. More than any other factor that I've studied in my research, we have found that expectations predict employment. Expectations predict employment outcome. Let me illustrate with just a, a few snapshots of finding from my own research. Let's take parent expectations, for example. In some of our studies, we found that young adults with developmental disabilities whose parents expected them to obtain post-graduation work way back when their son or daughter was still in high school, those young people were five times more likely to have paid employment in the first two years after graduation. Five times more likely. We found the same thing around educator expectations. When high school students with severe disabilities who had teachers who expected their students to have paid employment in their community, we followed those students along. They were 15 times more likely to get a job in the community for pay when the teachers held those expectations, right? And we see that over and over in other areas of the literature. And you can kind of raise the question why. It's not an expectation per se that changes outcomes, but they shape experiences. So when we help families 
catch this glimpse of a good life that includes employment, it starts to change a whole bunch of things. It changes what students are taught and where they're taught and with whom they're taught. And when we expect adults with intellectual disability to work for pay in the community, it changes how we design and deliver our services. It changes who we pursue partnerships with. It changes where we allocate our funding. So when we look at the personal plans that we craft or the transition plans, uh, do they reflect these high expectations around work? And I don't know what your IEPs look like. We have a, a privilege of, of, of uh, looking at those in Tennessee, and we're surprised how rarely those expectations are embodied in post-school goals. When you look at the adult service system in Illinois, only one in four adults with intellectual disability has integrated employment as part of their individual service plan. So expectations aren't always as high as we hope they'd be. We also know that our expectations emerge a lot from the values that we hold, the degree to which we come to see our students as having deep and intrinsic worth. Uh, that influences all we do, and part of ways of showing that we value our students is by seeing them as individuals. Obviously, students known by their names much more than by their labels, talked about as individuals rather than as a member of a larger group, and ones that we see as having individual interests and passions and preferences and strengths and needs. So what, does our, what do our written plans reveal about this posture in our work? Does every IEP or transition plan in our school look the same, or are they actually personalized and they look different for each student? Are we fitting students into existing transition and employment experiences, or are we trying to design our programs and supports to meet the needs of the students who are in front of us? And how much are we investing in person-centered approaches to planning and service delivery that reflect we come to know our students in deep and personal ways? And third, I think in terms of these postures, do we see our students as having gifts and talents that the community needs to receive? Do we know what those gifts and talents and passions are? And are we communicating those well out to businesses and others in the community who need to know about what the students bring to the uh, area of work? I think this is really important because most people in our communities outside of this room struggle to see students with intellectual disability as having strengths and gifts that are worth receiving. Those are pre prevailing societal attitudes, certainly. And it's not helped by the way we often define disability. Think about the ways we define autism or intellectual disability. They're up on your screen. We define based on deficit. We diagnose based on difference, right? We rush to remediate as researchers. We publish about problems. But such a message, such a way of knowing young people, if that's the only way we know them, has inadvertent consequences. So if you've got an employer who's considering the question, well, what would a person with autism bring to our business? Or someone who leads a community program who's wondering, well, how do we include someone with intellectual disability into our programs? And the only image they have of people with those labels is what you see on your screen. It's a really hard introduction. It's hard to envision a place for someone in the community only knowing what they cannot do or struggles to do. And of course, that's not how we know our students, but that's so how often the world sees our students. And that sort of ways of thinking about disability flattens their portrait. It becomes the danger, I think, of a single story. And so how do we start to tell a story about the strengths and gifts and passions and other things that our students uh, could bring to the workplace and to relationships in their community? You don't need a study to tell you this, but if you actually do research on the strengths of young people transition age youth with significant disabilities, you can become overwhelmed by the strengths and gifts that you hear. For example, we've done studies with parents where we've asked them to complete something called the assessment scale for positive character traits. It's a really kind of interesting measure. It has 26 statements addressing the degree to which their transition age youth with autism or intellectual disability shows characteristics like kindness and humor and gratitude and empathy and optimism, and forgiveness and courage. And when we've given those scales, a couple things happen. One is families, parents actually break down in tears often because it's the first time they've ever been given an assessment that's focused not on what their kid struggles to do or can't do, but actually some of the talents and strengths they might have. And the second thing is that the portrait that emerges is always one rich with strengths. In that area, that study where we've looked at 26 different strengths a young person might have, the, uh, the average person or the median number of strengths in that study was 20. No one had none. 
And so you start to say, how many businesses would benefit from hiring someone with qualities like honesty and persistence and optimism? Or how many neighbors would love to develop a friendship with someone known as funny or thoughtful or joyful? How many faith communities could find a place for someone known for their gratitude and empathy and kindness? And yet those are the characteristics of the students we serve as well. Right? So how do we tell that story to watching communities, one that doesn't just accentuate the things that we for no, so long have known people have struggled to do, and we, we start to advertise those strengths? It's the basis of a, a campaign that we do every October in Tennessee called Hire My Strengths. It simply makes the point that the connections to the workplace aren't facilitated by knowing everything that someone can't do. It's facilitated by knowing what the strengths are and then saying, where in our community does someone need exactly those kinds of strengths? And so that's a, sh a thing that we do every October um, as part of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And we also create one-page profiles of our students, which many of you do as well, which really, again, don't just focus on what their disability label is and all the things that would be hard for them, but instill it showcases the things that people compliment them on, the things that they're really good at, the skills they've developed throughout their transition programs, and the supports they would need in the workplace. And then those are shared out with businesses and others in the community who now are being introduced to students in a very different way. It's interesting. For one of the students, it has all these characteristics of things people compliment on, being neat, tidy, organized, persistent. And it's like, okay, that's a young man with autism. But aren't those exactly the things that an employer would want? And so how do we lead with that? And finally, in this area of postures, it's the way we serve that I think is revealing of our postures. And I know that this marks the work that you do, but it's so important. Do we strive to put the interests and the needs of transition age youth in our care ahead of our own? We're striving to do more than just what's convenient or easy or comfortable for us, but stepping into what is most necessary and fruitful for them. It's a way of serving students that's marked by a goodness and a kindness and a patience and an integrity. And I share all that because evidence-based practices are extremely powerful, right? We talk a lot about those. But people are the ones who implement practices, right? The postures with which we do that matter immensely. There's no disembodied practice that if you do, changes an outcome. It's all about who's doing it and the way we do it. And those matter a lot. So those postures are lived out. They're not internal states. It's the expectations that we hold, the values that we hold, the views that we embrace, the gifts we see, the ways we serve. All of those things are experienced. And what can we point to that tell us that we're doing these things well? And what difference might it make if we do those things well? And I share that, those are just a sampling of some of those postures. And I just wanna say one more time, you know, why this is so important. There will not always be a best practice to appeal to in our work. There's just, there's not always, our research isn't quite there in all these areas. There's not always a best practice. And so the more we sharpen our values, uh, and practice these kinds of postures, the more likely we're gonna make the right moves in the absence of any other guidance as well. So postures matter, but so do our practices. And so I wanna to turn to the second P. The services and supports that we deliver make a powerful difference in the lives of students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. You see this firsthand every day in your work. You uh, know that there are practices that lead to employment and community involvement, and we know there are practices that lead away from employment and community involvement. And we've got to know the difference between the two. And of course, I don't have time in my uh, four hours that they gave me this morning <laughs> to talk about all of those practices. But there are places where we can keep abreast of them and learn about those practices. We do have a strong and growing evidence base, and we want to be fluent in that. There's a lot we know about systematic instruction and employment assessment and work-based learning and on-the-job supports and community-level interventions uh, that, that uh, can guide us in this work. Uh, many of you are scholars or budding scholars in this area as well, and you're pushing this work forward. There's a lot of organizations that we should know about as transition teachers and uh, staff. They all have perplexing acronyms, NTACT, ICTW, CTCI, RRTC, and on. In fact, I think the more perplexing the acronym, the better the resources. That's, my, that's what I believe. <laughs> 
My point is simply to know about those because as we learn more as a field, there's places that you can, you can gather that. And of course, uh, the ICTW is the place for you in Illinois. For us in Tennessee, it's Transition Tennessee. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. It has portals for students, uh, for providers, and for educators all around employment. And this too, if you'd like to go and register for it, it is going to be free for all conference attendees for the next 24 hours. And then after that, it will also be free. It's always free. <laughs> so, yeah. You just want to create a sense of urgency in some way. Uh, so, um, so what are those practices that we should pursue? I just want to highlight a few of these as well. And again, it's so great seeing the workshops that follow this that are actually going to touch on some of what I'm going to highlight here as well. But one of these is high quality transition assessment and planning. And uh, you know, if we get the written plan wrong, paid employment so rarely materializes for our students. Um, and it's not that a plan is sufficient. We've got a lot of plans that, uh, that uh, we, we don't see implemented, they should be. But, but we should have a plan grounded in high quality transition assessment. Um, and again, you all probably know a lot about this in your work, but we've gotta be strategic about carrying out the sort of assessments that give us a rich portrait of students' interests and preferences and supports and their needs in all of those areas. And I punctuate interest, preferences, and strengths because that's what we have to know to get people jobs. That's the most important things we have to know and communicate. And we need to know that across areas, but particularly in the area of work, and those things change over time. So sometimes we think about assessment as a discrete event, um, and it isn't. And sometimes we think about assessment as a way of evaluating or judging a student. And I'd argue in transition it isn't. Uh, the Latin root word for assessment uh, means to sit beside, to sit beside. And to me, that kind of redeems the word assessment, which is often like evaluate and judge. But that's what we're doing is we're sitting alongside our students over time to help discern these kinds of things so that we're in a better position to create a set of experiences and instruction that are going to lead to employment. So you've got to know and have good employment assessments available to you. There's lots of places to find those assessments, um, but I did want to point out that one thing that we do have on our website at Transition Tennessee is an assessment database where you can go in and search for assessments by transition domain. You can search for assessments that are focused on strengths, interests, preference, needs, and you can search for assessments based on their cost. So there's a number of free ones here. Be careful what you get what you pay for sometimes. But my point is, there's a place to go if you're interested in like, where would I find an assessment that focuses on a student's strength in this particular area? And we've tried to compile those as well. I think those assessments then inform the development of compelling transition plans. And many of you are familiar with uh, NTAC's Indicator 13 checklist. It emphasizes the importance of grounding uh, goals in age-appropriate transition assessment and crafting services and coursework that advance those goals. I simply, in putting this up, say this is kind of a compliance level of focus. I want to just highlight there's two words that show up a couple times, reasonably enable, reasonably enable, reasonably enable. And I share that because when we're developing plans, we should step back as a team and look at them and say, yeah, I believe this plan would reasonably enable this student to get a paid job in their community now before graduation or afterwards. And I think there's a lot of times when we step back of our plans and we're not confident that that's actually the case. So that's a really important piece. It takes us beyond just the compliance towards the quality. A third practice relates to promoting self-determination. We want to make sure our practices are equipping our uh, young people with the skills and supports they need to be a leading voice in their own lives and their transition planning, to steer their lives in ways and directions that reflect what matters most to them. Are we really supporting that kind of self-determination within our practices? And this is often challenging when students have complex support needs, for sure. But self-determination is an important component of what we do. It's, it's a thing that we can teach and promote. Um, and there's plenty of research that documents this strong association between greater self-determination and a host of outcomes, including better employment outcomes. But it means that we as teachers and families as well should focus on building capacity in this area. 
Are we explicitly teaching skills related to choice making and decision making and problem solving and goal setting and self management and self awareness? And how are we helping our families to cultivate those skills at home as they're growing up? There's a great free downloadable guide that is designed for families about how they can promote this at home. And it might be something you share with your families as well. Ordinary ways of embedding that into uh, different activities, for example. I share that because the challenge for so many of us as family members or as teachers is to begin to shift our focus from us being at the forefront of setting these educational and transition goals, where it's really our desires and dreams that are driving things, to finding ways to equip our students to be able to articulate their own goals and dreams and to put them more at the forefront of setting those goals. This should jump out to you as an optical illusion that depending on which way you look, it pulls one of those forward. Um, if you can't see it, you can knock your neighbor. It's like those things you have to stare at. Remember and the picture would emerge. I can never get that to work. But I think this is the pitch that we have to make as our young people get older. Um, how do we help equip them in these areas to be the leading influence in those ways? Because the more motive, the more, um, the more their employment goals are sort of driven by their own desires and they're working toward them, the more motivated they'll be in the area of work as well. Well, the fourth practice involves supporting our students to access typical experiences in their school and community, right alongside their peers and others uh, who don't have disability. Uh, in transition, location also matters. Longitudinal studies tell us that inclusion in school Early inclusion predicts inclusion in the community down the road. And uh, I don't know that this is a, maybe a, a too forceful way of saying it, but I would argue the corollary is true, that early segregation in our schools uh, not only predicts later segregation, it almost guarantees it. In other words, if students, uh, student, we can't expect them to be part of community life if the whole of their growing up was isolated from those experiences. So often movement is only in one direction we see as students get older. It tends to be towards the peripheries of community. And we've got to change that trajectory. And so going back to your own memories of middle school and high school, it's about thinking about the classes and the clubs and the extracurricular activities and the service learning projects that you were part of and think about the skills you developed in those experiences and the relationships and the goals that prepared you for life after high school. Think about the ways that your own aspirations were shaped by the kids you spent time with. And these kinds of activities can provide motivating context for students to develop their interests and strengths and preferences. It creates affiliations with other peers and creates social support. It fosters a sense of belonging and value in the community. And these are the places where students also develop important skills that can serve them well in the workplace and lifelong enjoyment. My point in all of that is that students with significant disabilities are so often isolated from those experiences. How can we build those connections? And then a fifth practice relates to making sure that our students are part of a progression of career development experiences that help them envision work and equips them with the skills and the dispositions and the knowledge to pursue that work. This is already well known to you. I know you're already deeply invested in this. So I just want to make sure I'm punctuating how important this piece is. One part of that might be including students in the ordinary career development experience already available at your high school for any student. What I put up on the screen is not on the screen. <laughs> I have no idea. There it is. <laughs> on the screen is things that high schools typically offer for any student without a disability, for example, that helps put them on a career pathway. The percentages are the percentages of high schools that actually offer these things. Maybe your school offers some of these. But we also collect data on the per participation of students with severe disabilities, and we find they're so rarely included in the things their schools already offer. How can we promote those connections to, to tours of colleges, job shadowing programs, interview and resume writing practice, guest speakers from outside businesses, um, a, a career and job counseling, and on and on and on. So accessing those experiences is really an important part of their uh, transition preparation. But we also know that for students with significant disabilities, the most important and impactful experiences will be the hands-on experiences. I mean, by a show of hands, how many of you were in middle school or high school had a paid job at some point before you graduated? Kind of. So that would be 93, well, 94%. <laughs> I'm just, I'm totally making that up. It's most of you, right? 
And think about sort of how those experiences shaped what you want to do, what you don't want to do, right? Involvement in school or community-based work experiences turns out to give our students occupational skills and values. It informs their own career decision making. It shapes their aspirations for the world of work. But it also, those experiences provide an opportunity for hands-on places to teach functional and social skills to inform their career plans, to expand their social networks, to give them a resume that demonstrates that they can be hired and can be successful, and for promoting connections to the community. In fact, in one of our studies, we found that the factor that best predicts community employment for students with severe disabilities in the early years after graduation is simply having at least one paid work experience before they graduate, just like all of you raised your hand. You change kids' trajectories when you connect them to at least one paid work experience before the school bus stops coming. In fact, you'll elevate their uh, odds of working between two and a half and three times by that experience alone. And we're in the midst right now of a large study that's looking at the impact of paid work experiences for high school students with severe disabilities before they graduate. We're looking at that last year before exit. And what struck us, even in the midst of the pandemic, is actually how readily schools have been able to connect students to paid jobs by making this an intentional focus of their planning, not their post-school planning, but their in-school planning, by engaging families in this process and bringing aboard support from pre providers and outside agencies. So paid work is a normative experience for most high school students. We want that to become a normative experience for kids with severe disabilities, but that does require us thinking differently about how we do transition services. And I'm throwing that out. I know that's hard work. It's, and it sometimes requires some, some long haul changes in the way we do transition programming. We're amidst that work in Tennessee as well. So I get that, but that think about expectations and pay work and what that does for our students down the road. And the final piece I'll meet around, mention around practices is just the importance of helping our students find places in their communities where their talents and gifts can be shared. And that's maybe in the world of work, but it also means helping them find places to volunteer and serve in their community as well. When we do that, it changes dramatically the views that society has about people with disabilities. Some of you are familiar with the idea of social role valorization, uh, big words, but the idea that good things come to people when they have valued roles in the community. And that's true for our students as well. So I'm not advocating volunteer experiences in lieu of paid experiences, but something changes when we see kids with severe disabilities serving rather than just being served by communities. It changes how communities view people. So when students have individualized and ambitious transition plans, when they have a say in their lives, when they're included in their school and community, when they explore the world of work early on and repeatedly, and when they're supported to make contributions in valued roles, they're much more likely to connect to paid work in their early years after high school. They're much more likely to have better outcomes. And so the final piece of this puzzle relates to people and to partnerships postures, practices, and now people. Now, I often talk about people being the peer relationships that students develop, and I think those are absolutely critical, right? We flourish most in the midst of relationships. But here, I wanna park on uh, relationships as, uh, as it has to do with schools and community partners. The relationships that we develop with other educators, providers, disability professionals, and other community members. And I'm more and more convinced that the changing of the employment landscape for students with severe disabilities is actually gonna require us to engage people outside of the service system, outside of the school system in new ways. We need new allies and advocates who we can partner with. We have to think about how do we find employers and community networks and organizations and others in our community who could be instrumental in inviting and welcoming and supporting people with disabilities into the workplace. We cannot go it alone when we think about transition to employment. It isn't merely about the preparation we give until they're 18 or 21. If there's no employer willing to hire them, no community willing to accept them, no transportation provider to get them there, right? And on and on and on. We've got to think about the whole community as kind of our unit of movement here. It's the coordinated efforts more and more across formal systems and informal systems that we think make the difference. And I, I point that out with lots of arrows to show how these intersect, but I'm gonna put up a, a graphic that there's no way you can read, and that's the whole point. 
we, <laughs> we just, we've recently finished a project where we're looking at the barriers to employment for transition age youth with severe disabilities. And there's a whole lot of barriers, obviously. Barriers related to how we do school, related to family expectations and commitment, to the community's uh, receptivity and even job opportunities, to the service system that, while we're working to make it better, is often fragmented and not fully available to, to meet all these needs. And even the skills and challenges and mindsets of our students. So if we're going to address those barriers, we have to think collectively about how we engage other partners in this work. So let me just highlight a few examples of interesting partnerships that uh, have been part of our employment projects over the years. There's lots of others, it's just a snapshot, uh, but there are more people I'm finding willing to engage with us uh, than we might, not think, but we might think. And one of them, of, of course, is our uh, Chambers of Commerce and Local Employment Networks. These are the uh, groups that are associations of employers who are committed to the economic interests of the local community. They usually represent a broad range of industry sectors. They have extensive networking opportunities. They know economic forecast information about what jobs are most needed in a community. And they often support local groups. But so rarely are they drawn upon by secondary schools as partners in this work and almost never around students with disabilities. A number of years ago, we found that they're actually quite willing to help in these ways. In one of our studies in Wisconsin, we asked local chambers of commerce about the ways they would be willing to help promote the employment of youth with significant disabilities. And these are the areas up on the screen that most chambers said we'd be willing to do. Now, not all, but most, the majority in our sample. Things like uh, our organization could partner with the local high school to co-sponsor a job fair, to co-sponsor job shadowing experiences, to help uh, match youth to job openings in the community, to create a directory of employers with jobs or internships available to youth with disabilities, to provide feedback to teachers on our transition programs, to offer job uh, mock interviewing or resume writing practice for youth. They're willing to um, include information about the school's transition programs in their own website or networks with employers. Uh, they're willing to have guest speakers from high schools talk to employers about what they offer. They're willing to help identify employers in the community willing to do job shadowing opportunities for youth with disabilities, to promote paid or uh, unpaid work experiences for youth, to speak with other employers who've had a, a positive experience hiring youth who can be kind of give testimony to other employers, uh, to meet with schools to talk about what, uh, with youth about what businesses are looking for in hiring people. Um, and they could also invite teachers to talk with their employers in their network about the benefits of hiring youth with disabilities, about tax incentives, uh, and uh, ways to recruit youth as employers, employees rather. I remember a time that we worked with one local community where the local high school partnered with the local chamber of commerce and at uh, their monthly chamber breakfasts, all they did is they asked, could we share one of our one page profiles at your chamber breakfast? Once a month, they'd get together, the employers would get together, they would print copies of it, they'd pass it around, they'd have two or three minutes to talk about the young person, and then they'd pose the question, which of you or who do you know in our community who could use someone like this in their place of business? They did that 12 months in a row, 10 of those months, young people were hired by the end of the month. Right? Simply by not a teacher having to go to a million businesses, but by bringing teachers and students to those networks as well. The second partnerships involved identifying what we often call business liaisons, some prominent or well-connected individual in the local community who knows the local employment landscape inside and out, who has relationships with area employers. And so as we as schools undertake good transition planning and employment planning, when we figure out what a student could do and what they'd love to do and what they'd be great at, we then work with the business liaison to say, who do you know in the community who could use a student with that kind? Who do you know in this business sector that you could introduce us to that we could uh, then introduce the student to as well? So again, it's tapping into people who know business well to make introductions and not expecting them to know anything about disability. So that might be the person who runs the family business, that's been, a family restaurant that's been there for 50 years, uh, who's just a, a, a member of the chamber or something else as well. A third partnership involves the establishment of a local advisory or whole community team that brings together a cross section of business owners and CTE staff and special educators and others to create viable work opportunities in their local community. There's lots of names that these have some from simply transition advisory teams. Many of you might be familiar with the circles approach out of uh, UNC Charlotte. 
we call this whole community teams in Tennessee. And we're just trying to get people who know the community well to come together to figure out uh, what are the needs of students that aren't being met in the community that we can begin to network and, and develop greater capacity in our own community. We've got some great resources you can download on how to launch one of those teams as well. And fourth, I think we can invite communities to provide employment supports in unexpected ways. For example, we've been working uh, with faith communities on something called the Putting Faith to Work Project. It's a way of addressing employment needs of youth and young adults with disabilities who are connected to a local congregation. And it's a really simple thing. We simply uh, invite some small group of members from that local congregation to come alongside the student with the disabilities who already attends there, to have a good conversation about what that student's gifts and passions and maybe even sense of calling is, and then to network through their church or synagogue to say who works in a place like that, who shops in a place like that, who's the neighbor to someone in a place like that, and they start to share out what they've learned with that community. And how are most jobs found? They're found through people we know. So this may not be a way for, uh, uh, for every entity, but there are congregations in every community. There's uh, 12,453 in Illinois, and there's 211 in this county as well. So it's interesting. And what do I mean by they have the capacity? So if you think about a local congregation, it's often in smaller towns, one of the largest networks of employers in that community. It's filled with someone who works at the local university, who coordinates a nonprofit network, who does odd jobs around town, who operates a daycare, and on and on and on. And so you might be surprised that in that person's community is someone who works in or shops in or goes to a place where that person might want to work as well. But it's not just that. A congregation is also a place where people are connected to lots of other people. And most jobs come through who you know. So when we start to think, if we did this here, what are all the affiliations that you have in your community? You start to see that there's lots of connections that people have to other groups that could be critical to finding potential job openings perhaps some of these as well. And not only that, but in some congregations, there are people who have gifts and talents and skills themselves that could help a young person forge the path to work as well. People who, help, who already know how to write a beautiful resume and could help a young person do that, who could uh, encourage them, who could provide transportation, who could practice job interviewing, who could mentor them in an area that was their job, and on and on. My point in this is here's just one sort of wacky, kind of out-of-the-box way of thinking about getting people jobs. We partnered with 20 congregations, 60 people with intellectual development disabilities got jobs for the first time. No service system involvement. On the front end, it was congregations coming together, helping get to know a person, and then from that networking thing with, within their networks to figure out what that might look like. It doesn't have to be a faith community. You could think about Civitan or Moose or, or Optimist or Kiwanis or any kind of affiliation or network in your local community. It's about asking good questions and inviting people who know the community well but don't know a darn thing about disability. And actually, that's sometimes a real gift because they don't think inside the usual boxes that we do as well. My point is, uh, those congregations put together one-page profiles. They did that for Kate. They shared that out through their men's and women's group, and Kate got a job that she really wanted because it turns out that a person who went to her business runs plant operations for a large university and said, I know Kate. I know what she can do. I'll connect her with a person who can support her, and uh, we'll, ha we'll hire her starting next week. And she did, and she made a really good salary. Um, others have put together these reverse job ads, like they did also for another Kate, where they shared about how Kate serves in that local congregation, that she's looking for a job. They shared that out with people, and she ended up getting also connected to a job at a local salon. Others put that on their blogs or on their websites where resumes are shared. It happened for Clayton, who, who is a diehard Predators fan, and it certainly helped that one of the higher level CEOs at the Predators happened to go to his church. And guess what? <laughs> He ended up hiring Clayton, said, come down the next day, go down, and uh, you'll get a job, which is amazing because all the barriers to getting into a place like that. And then it turned out that worked out so well, he ended up making a commitment for the Predators to end up hiring 30 people with intellectual disability within their system, right? right? It just comes through another way of thinking about networking. Here, too, we've got a free manual. You can, uh, and again, it doesn't just apply to faith communities, but other, other networks as well. And finally, let me mention a community-wide model or partnerships that I am especially enamored with, and this will be what I do a breakout on after uh, the second session. 
there's a growing number of communities that are hosting things called community conversations. They're events that are designed to bring a cross-section of that town or county together for an evening of conversation about how we can uh, improve employment or other outcomes for young people with disabilities. It's a way of generating some really creative out-of-the-block solutions for a, a transition to employment, but ones that reflect local priorities and possibilities. So basically a local planning team, which is often a school or transition team, invites a cross section of that community, 50 to 80 people to come together for a two hour event over dessert and coffee. This is really important. There must be chocolate there. Like, do you do that set up? People will come. The catch is half the people who come aren't within the education or disability service system. They're employers, community leaders, civic groups, faith community leaders, and others who know the community, don't know a thing about disability, who are invited to say, what could we as a community do to improve employment outcomes? You're really just trying to get new voices into this conversation. Uh, you might pose a question like, what could we do as a community to expand meaningful opportunities for youth with disabilities in this community? And then people gather around round tables in this really clever way of doing the two hour event where people are sharing their best ideas for how we can help improve transitions or promote uh, students um, transition to employment. We've done about 70 of these events across Tennessee and many in Kentucky and Wisconsin and elsewhere. These are just snapshots of what those events look like. And it's amazing for a guy who's a very quantitative guy to realize what power there is when you get the right people in the room brainstorming out-of-the-box ways of making a difference. I've seen more movement in communities because of these as catalysts than almost any other interventions that we've done. Because people now are excited about ideas that have come about. They volunteer to be part of implementing those ideas. And the community starts to move forward with a local plan that doesn't rely just on schools to do this or on agencies to do this. There's buy-in from the broader community. You can do these events around employment, uh, and disability. You can do them around transition more broadly, transition to all kinds of outcomes. We've focused them on independent living, and we've done them on a number of college campuses where we've been trying to get those college campuses to start a college programs for students with intellectual disability. So all of these are venues where you can apply that approach, and I'll walk through what it looks like to do that and share some stories of that. My point is we have to engage new people within and beyond the service system in new ways to make this happen. So let me try to pull it all together. It's about the postures that we adopt, the practices that we pursue, and the people that we engage. And so let me just close with making a few points that you've probably already picked up on in just my, uh, my uh, 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 I was gonna say my limited time with you, but I know from the audience, it's like, this is going on really, really long. <laughs> so, the first is uh, data is not a four letter word. I mean, Technically, it's a four-letter word, but it's not a curse word. And I think sometimes we sort of repulse at sort of the idea of data collection in too many ways. But we have to know, we have to have some way of knowing whether the investment we're making in these postures and practices and partnerships are actually leading to employment outcomes, whether they're leading toward it or away from it. That's really, really critical. And so, you know, to quote, quote the great Yogi Berra, if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. We need good data to accompany our movements. And, uh, you know, as we say in Tennessee, in God we trust, but all others must bring data. And so it's true. Like, you know, it's not just about that indicator 14 data or case closure data. That's important. I don't just mean blunt data about outcomes. I mean getting a richer portrait of students' employment experiences and the things that are leading toward that. One of the studies that I showed earlier where we asked families about uh, why work matters so much, we also asked about the aspects of work that were valued most. And yes, it was about a paid job, but it was actually about getting the right kind of paid job for their son or daughter. Um, these are the features that were valued most to least by families. They're echoed in our conversations with youth and young adults with disabilities. It's about the right number of hours, the availability of adequate supports, having responsibilities that match to their abilities, having an inclusivity of a workplace, uh, some sense of community, and on and on and on. So we have to take time reflecting on our data and determining how they shape our movements forward. Right? We don't just collect data for the sake of having data. We want to steward that well. And so we need points of reflection. You might come up with your own. 
uh, as a school, but you might use some of the sort of broader transition principles that we know matter. Are we using person-centered planning? Are we focusing on strengths? Are we fostering self-determination? Are we holding high expectations? Are we connecting our students to early work experiences? Are we focusing on outcomes? Are we developing strong partnerships? Are we adopting data-driven approaches? Are we starting transition early? And are we moving beyond <coughs> compliance? So those are just markers of that. You can download a reflection tool that your team could use as well. And so my last point then is we've got to remain reflective and humble in this work as we move forward. The striking thing about our history is that we've almost always been wrong about what people with disabilities could accomplish and how they could, be, how they could contribute. When you look back at our history, we've almost always been short-sighted. I'm not talking about you in this room, but just as a field, we've always been short-sighted. When I was trained as a transition teacher, we never talked about or envisioned college for students with intellectual disabilities, right? So we see that looking backwards. But here's the thing, one day down the road, people will look back at us and they'll wonder why we didn't see what was possible uh, down the road. They'll wonder how what we've advocated now was so short-sighted and didn't quite hit the mark that we couldn't see a better or different way. And so we become their barbarous ancestors. Like right now we look back and say, how could they have proposed those things? But people will be looking back at us. My point in this isn't to sort of frighten you that 30 years from now people will be talking about that Eric Carter, I can't believe how short-sighted he was. It's to make the point that we've got to be uh, willing to seek out guidance and ask for feedback and be very reflective and be willing to change our course if the movements we're making aren't leading to these goals, if they're not leading to employment and flourishing of our students. All right, we've got to be willing to do that so we don't keep going down the wrong direction and building something that the next cohort of teachers is gonna have to undo. And of course, that means we've got to press on in this work. So let me close this talk where I began. I think the most compelling services and supports in education is driven by this deep commitment to helping students with disabilities flourish, to thrive in ways that lead to a good life or as we talk about an enviable life. And so as you think about the students with intellectual and developmental disabilities that you're serving and supporting, think about the postures that you're adopting and the practices that you're pursuing and the people that you're drawing into relationship and be intentional about collecting and reflecting on good data so you know whether the movements you're making are making the kind of difference you hope for. So thank you for your investment, your deep investment in the lives of students with significant disabilities all across Illinois to flourish in all the ways that matter most in their workplace, absolutely, but also in their communities, in their education, and in their relationships. And thank you for the generous invitation to be with you today. Thank you.